Okay, everybody, let's take a seat and we're going to keep going on sacraments. Let's start with a prayer. Today is the feast of St. Clair. So we start in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your gift to the saints, and especially for Claire, her great love for you and pursuing you with all her heart that led her to um, go into the, des the desert, as it were, um, religious life, um, almost cloistered life. And we pray, Lord, that her witness of uh, complete and utter love for you may spur us on to desire you in our own hearts and lives and to find our way finally to the kingdom where she is also now. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Anybody remember Brother, Son, Sister Moon? Yeah. yeah. It's a little romanticized, but um, but it's a very poetic and beautiful kind of uh, look, mostly at Francis, but at Claire also. But there definitely was some kind of real bond, and you'll find that a lot of times with saints, there is a, a companion to them. There is another saint that uh, is working and supporting, they're supporting each other. Um, and that could be like uh, Vincent de Paul and St. Louis de Marillac. She founded the sisters, the daughters of today, become daughters of St. Paul. Um, Mother Cabrini and Father Scalabrini, who uh, came to the United States to take care of the Italians and uh, is now up for canonization. Uh, and it goes on and on there. It's really beautiful to see. And I was talking to somebody about this earlier that um, you never find a saint in isolation. In other words, they, they seem to find each other. And they seem to um, begin to uh, support and to help each other discern and figure out what God's asking, you know, from the uh, Padre Pio, who's so very famous, whether well, it's a priest who was a very good friend of his. And actually, when you read Padre Pio, he, he often would tell people, go to go to Father, he's the Holy One. And that was a Father Dolindo, Dolindo. And he died in the 70s, but he's up for canonization now too. And had a kind of a, a mystical uh, life, just like uh, Padre Pio did. He's written a lot of beautiful books that finally are being translated into uh, English. Anyway. So thank you to St. Clair and St. Francis today. So we're looking at um, the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, which come up in the Didache. Now, the word is Didache. Let's say it together. Didache. Didache. What was it? Didache. How'd you say it? Okay, I don't want you to forget it because it's a good word. It's one of those... Uh, uh, $5 billion words you can throw down and, and people are like, what is that? What are you talking about? And now you can really jump into it and say, hey, it's the oldest document we have outside of the New Testament canon. And um, there's a lot of good in there that shows what was going on in the church at the time. So it's a great place, especially with friends who are not Catholic, uh, but who have a love for wanting to know what, what Christianity is all about. Um, this is one of those documents that will resonate, even though they may not be familiar with it. In a lot of ways, it will resonate with them. So, um, next slide, please. Okay. So we're going to talk about baptism and Eucharist, but I just want to go over quickly with you just what a sacrament is. Um, a lot of us, me included, grew up with the Baltimore Catechism. 
I grew up at St. Columbus Church in Garden Grove, and we were, if I remember correctly, we were the last church in the diocese to change, to move the altar out and so forth. So because of that, I experienced um, Gregorian chant, um, the extraordinary rite, what we call that today, the Latin mass, um, uh, benediction and, and all these wonderful things, but all in Latin. And then, of course, I experienced the church that we, we know and love today. So um, when I was growing up at St. Columbus School, we were still using the Baltimore Catechism. Then when I got into, I think, about seventh or eighth grade, then we began to change the catechetics. But does anybody remember um, the definition of the sacrament from Baltimore Catechism? Yes, which is right up there. <laughs> yeah. An outward sign should be there somewhere. Instituted by Christ to give grace. Very simple, okay? But um, very important because it helps us then to figure out the seven sacraments. Now, sacraments or mysteries, that's what they're called in the East. Eastern Catholic Church and Orthodox do not refer to the seven as sacraments. That's a Western word, they refer to it as, or to them as mysteries. So um, a sacrament, what it does is it teaches and it points to something, but they give the grace that they signify. Um, grace is just the life of God. Okay, there's different categories we can talk about, actual grace and all these other wonderful categories, but let's keep it simple. It's the life of God. And you can't merit it. You can't work hard for it. You can't say 20 rosaries and then you get a, a point closer or something like that. It's not the way it works. Remember that rosaries and these wonderful things that we do um, are to affect us and to open our hearts more to God. That's what they're for. And later on, we'll look at that. They're called sacramentals. They're like little sacraments. But whereas a sacrament actually gives grace, the life of God, a sacramental doesn't. So um, a medal of the Virgin that you might wear, the rosary that you have, these things don't give grace. They don't. But what they do is they prepare you, they inspire you to be able to actualize, to receive um, the sacraments. Okay, They move you towards sacraments. It's just like we say, you may have heard, and it's very true, that um, everything we do in church, all the devotions, uh, Legion of Mary, Knights of Columbus, um, Women's Guild, all these wonderful things that we have, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, um, prayers in church, um, all these things eventually, and even adoration, have to lead us to the altar. They lead us to Mass. Mass is the high point, okay? Mass is everything. So all these other things are moving us towards that. Why is that? Well, because in the Mass, the bread and wine become the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. So he's present, not symbolically, but really. And because of that, everything revolves around that. And John Paul used to say that the Mass also moves us towards adoration of the sacrament. So the closer and closer you get to um, a great appreciation for the Mass, the more you want to spend silent time, personal time, with Christ in adoration. Because the Mass is not a private moment. Although there is a lot of uh, private things going on, we pray and so forth, but it's a communal prayer. It's a community prayer, and it's meant to be. It's not meant to be a private prayer. Interestingly, though, when everybody receives Holy Communion, you come back, and I've had people ask me who aren't Catholic, what are you all doing when you, after you receive Holy Communion? And I, I tell them, well, that's a good question because I don't know. Because everybody's doing something different. 
Some people um, are kneeling down when they come back. They come back to the pew, they kneel down and they begin prayer. Some people are seated in the pew, they're praying. Um, St. Dominic wrote that after communion uh, in all his churches, that he said, if you come back from communion, sit, kneel, stand, or lay down on the floor. And so that's a custom that the Dominicans have had that in that moment of silence, you can experience it in those different ways. Now, if somebody lays down on the floor in our church, we're going to call an ambulance. <laughs> but it's in the Dominican thing, you know, to do that. So the point being that um, that there is some, you know, there is what we'll call private moments in the mass. That's that's for sure. Um, when you're going up to receive Holy Communion, everybody approaches the sacrament differently, of course, because we're all different human beings. But it ne does not, and it cannot take away from the fact that it is a communal prayer, just like the Last Supper was. All right, so um, St. Augustine was a big proponent of this, that um, grace cannot be merited. You cannot win it. You cannot um, somehow convince God. Um, all It is a free gift. In other words, God gives grace to us. He gives it to you, and it's up to you and me to respond. And so um, uh, later on, we'll look at this. For instance, when you're receiving Holy Communion, and maybe somebody goes up and they receive rather flippantly, they just take the Eucharist and they put it in their mouth and they walk away. And it doesn't seem like something is clicking there the way it should. Um, but that doesn't take away that that's the Eucharist. It's still Jesus in all his beauty, goodness, effectiveness, ability to move you and change you. But if you're closed off, if for some reason you're not in the moment, um, it keeps the grace from really flowing. Uh, uh, so it might be like, you know, you have a, a beaver that, you know, builds the dam in the water, and after a while the water begins to slow down and maybe even stop. You know, so you have to break that, that beaver dam over again, and then all of a sudden the water's going again. And so that could be just our own distractedness. It could be sin. It could be all sorts of things that get in the way. Um, being overwhelmed with um, the concerns of life, which you're not supposed to be. It's easy for us all to get overwhelmed, and sometimes in the moment we forget how wrong that is. Okay, when you're overwhelmed, you do something about it, but you don't continue to victimize yourself, you know, to suffer and suffer and suffer, you know, or uh, maybe something happened in the past and this happens. Uh, we get a lot of folks that come to confession. Something happened in the past. I feel very, very badly about it. And I just, it's been years now. I cannot get it out of my head. I just keep thinking on it, going over it, over it, and over it. And, you know, well, you were, especially people will say, well, Father, I confessed it, and I just, I don't know, you can't forget me. God, I don't think God forgave. No, he forgave you. It's complete with God. It's that sometimes we find it very hard to forgive ourselves, and we keep punishing ourselves. But that really doesn't give very much glory to the, the sacrament of penance or confession, that, thank God, the Lord relieves us of these things. And gives us grace anew to start over. But instead, you know, I am determined to punish myself. So you've got to think that out because it's not good. It's not healthy. It's, it's see, all sacraments and religion in, in general is about freedom. And freeing you in the midst of a world that's very complicated so that you just walk right through all the chaos. Okay. And, and sometimes, of course, you know, we get bumped, we get everything else, and as you're walking through, maybe even we lose our lives because that can happen, martyrdom and so forth. But, but the point being that in the heart, though, I get it. In the heart, 
I know in my soul, I know that Jesus is with me no matter where it takes me, even if that takes me to having to um, give my life up for him. Okay. okay. So grace is given. This is what we call it. If you, you want to write this down, this is kind of another big deal in theology. Ex opere operatu, Latin. And what it means very basically is from the work performed. That's what it means. I'll just explain that a little bit because I think it's important. So the gift of grace is objective, not subjective. It's there. It doesn't depend on you at all. It's there. Now that's very good. Because how many of us, if it was the other way around, where it was subjective and it did depend on me, you know, uh, where would we be with that? Would the grace really come to me? Or how much grace would I merit, you know? But this isn't the way God has designed this. God says, no, the grace is there, I'm there. I'm there for you. You can never exhaust me, but I'm there for you. And it's just up to you to open the door to me. So um, St. Catherine Labore, when I visited um, the Miraculous Metal Shrine uh, in France, the first time I've been there about three or four times, I loved the shrine. Daughters of St. Vincent de Paul, they run it. And um, one of the sisters, St. Catherine Labore, relates that um, she was woken up at night. She's there in this huge convent. The sisters are all asleep. And there was a light that came streaming through the um, closed door. And then the door opened and there was this young man in a um, white owl. And she said he was probably about 14 or 15. And he just looked at her all glowing and smiled. And then he just went like this. Didn't say anything, just did this. And so she got up and she followed him through the long corridors and it was all, everything's dark, but wherever he is, it's light. And then finally they um, they get to the chapel, they open up the doors, they walk into the chapel. And when they walk into the chapel, it's a side, and she heard rustling of a dress. And she looked forward at the altar and there was the Virgin seated on a chair in front of the altar. And so then she goes up and then begins um, these wonderful conversations that will happen. Um, a number of uh, visitations of Mary. I mean, if you go today, the chair is still there. It's a simple chair and it's in the corner. And a lot of people don't know that that's the chair that Catherine said the Virgin would sit in. But people, you, you get an idea something is going on here because people leave little papers and they write their prayers or their hopes. They leave that on the chair, hoping the Virgin will, you know, respond to those and see those. And, and love those prayers to Jesus. So, um, but she, St. Catherine relates that at one point, Mary said, I wish that you strike a medal with my arms out. And that's what we know as the miraculous medal. And O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Right? That goes around it. And um, when she held her hands out, she said, rays came forth, not from her hands or her fingers, but from rings that were on her, her fingers, on both hands. And some of the rings were dark. And so St. Catherine asked her, why? What does that mean? And she said, these are the rays are the, uh, or the rings represent um, the different graces that God has accorded to her to help people. And yet the ones that are dark are the ones that people never ask for anything. They never ask for those. They only ask for the more, you know, um, uh, save my marriage, you know, help me with my faith. And but there are, she said there are so many other graces that God has given, but we don't explore them. And so this was one of the things that uh, is very important to, to think on, too, is where does grace lead your prayer life? So when you pray, how do you pray? What are you asking for? Are you always asking? Because there's times where you should not ask. 
and you should just sit and be with him. You know how it is when you love somebody and you know and um, uh, when you're with them and they're they're always uh, asking you for this or that. Can you drive me here? Can you take me there? You know, I need money for this, and maybe that's kids most of the time. And uh, but isn't it nice when when your kid just sits with you and says, "Hey, mom, let's just watch a movie," and that's it. You know, and there's something really special, and it hits us that wow, you know, just wants to be with me. Isn't that great? Okay, and and in a lot of ways, you have to remember that relationships among human beings are patterns for God, patterns for heaven, patterns for what happens in the relationship with God as well. And God loves when a soul just wants to be with him, that kind of love. Nothing in particular to be said, nothing needed, and maybe there are needs, but, but just wants to be with, with Jesus, with Christ, right? So, um, as you see here, whether a person feels or thinks that, for example, that the Eucharist, that Holy Communion is not Christ, doesn't matter. It is Christ. So it doesn't matter on you or me. Maybe we're having a bad day. Maybe we're super distracted as we're coming up to Holy Communion and we don't feel it. It doesn't matter. It's still Jesus. That's good. It's not bad. That's good. Because I don't want it dependent on my feelings. Because what are feelings? Feelings are like this and that. They're like the ocean. We're over here, and then tomorrow we're over there, and we're really excited today, and then tomorrow we're kind of depressed, and then we're anxious, and it's just the way human beings are, you know? But to know that God is constant in his love, that it doesn't change having to do with our feelings, um, is, a, is a really beautiful promise given to God of his um, uh, desire to be with us, good days and bad, sickness and health. I will love you and honor you all the days of your life. That's basically what God says, the beautiful marriage vows. So it does not depend on us. So the degree of grace received depends, however, on how well the soul is disposed to receive it. So um, if in mortal sin, the door is shut. Mortal sin creates a barrier that needs to be healed or taken down. And when it isn't taken down, uh, grace cannot be received. Okay. So um, how important it is to keep a kind of a watch over ourselves. Um, I was with a, a religious sister not too long ago and, and she was telling me, you know, um, Father, make sure you do your night prayer. And I said, why? You know, where are you going with it? And she said, it's very important at the end of every day. It's very healthy, even psychologically, emotionally. At the end of the day, you just take a little bit of time at bedtime, and you just begin by thinking, okay, what went well and what didn't go well today? What was the, the good things that happened that I'm thankful for? And then the things that you know, I didn't do so hot. You know, or I wish I would have been more patient, or maybe, I, you know, I fell into sin. Okay, and then you simply do a prayer of abandonment, a prayer of, Lord, I love you. Help me tomorrow to be a better person. And it ends. Now, of course, night prayer in the breviary is a little bit more ordered and beautiful, and we have antiphons and all sorts of things. But the heart of what that is is actually very simple, and you could do that tonight. It's very easy. You're getting ready to bed, make the sign of the cross, lay in your bed and just say, okay, today was a good day. Father Al's talk was fantastic. <laughs> and, but, you know, and then, you know, or maybe, you know, some things, you know, it was a difficult day because a family member or a friend was really difficult. Um, and maybe you lost your cool on the road, if, you know, somebody cut you off and, you know, and so these are things that we bring to God and we say, Lord, I don't want to be an angry person. I don't want to react to other people's, you know, uh, problems or what they do. And I, I want to be positive. I want to be effective, you know, in, in what I do. Um, so God who respects our freedom waits for that door to open. And this touches on the whole question of um, heaven and hell. You know, and 
the big question of how could a loving God send anyone to hell? It's not a bad question. But if you realize that God respects our freedom so much that he will not even force you into relationship, he won't force you to love him, he won't force you even into heaven, he will honor you so much that he will respect your decision, your life decision. And um, at judgment time, what happens, of course, we, we go before God and judgment happens. But um, a lot of um, saints have written that it's, you, we get it wrong a little bit that we think, okay, you, you know, you get sometimes those uh, uh, kind of a, uh, you know, St. Michael is there with the, can we, Good and bad scales are going crazy, and you're wondering well, where's it going to end up. And you know, and that's a, a kind of a caricature, because really, what happens is before Christ, when you meet Him, first of all, to see Him is everything. So this is the ultimate moment for the human being, who now is in the presence of Jesus and sees Him, hears Him, looks at Him. All the veils are taken away. We have veils in front of us, as it were, in this world. Um, do you remember the prayer of this valley or this veil of tears? Right? But there's that sense, too, that uh, we're, we're impeded a lot of times from really getting it, understanding it, because of the human condition, because of sin, and so forth. But at judgment, all that is removed. So we see very clearly and definitely now who Jesus is, who God is, which is beautiful. And the soul judges itself in effect, because the soul that is in total honesty now, transparent, total honesty, knows where it belongs. And it cannot go to heaven if it doesn't belong there. It will walk away and go to hell because that's where it belongs. Or it will say to God, I cannot go yet. We call that purgatory purification. We'll touch on that later too. Purgatory gets too um, dramatized. And it really is very simple and beautiful. And, um, and thank God we have it because it allows us to let go of baggage, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So um, it's very important then that uh, we begin the process of going home to heaven now. No matter that you're in great shape and great health, it should begin now. And what that means is, what are the things that I need to, um, to let go of that are impeding my journey with Jesus? Because guess what? Um, I could be walking to pavilions tomorrow and get hit by a car. I'm in reasonably good shape, but I could get hit and it'd be all over. But am I ready? You know, am I ready for the Lord? Am I ready for that moment? Because what I want is to be able to look upon the Lord and in total honesty say, I can hardly wait. I'm here. I'm home. And then him open his arms and taking me. Right? So, um, but for that to happen, it means we have to let go of stuff now. Learn to let go of things that have accumulated over time. You know, my mom, she passed away, and I've been going to the house and spending a couple of hours here and there, just going through things. And I'm just like, oh, my amazed all the stuff that she accumulated. I can't tell you how many rosaries I have found. And I decided I'm going to take all of those things to the Mother Teresa sisters and give it to them, and then they can give them out to people, whatever. But, I mean, it's just too much. Even if I gave out to all my family um, these, these really beautiful things, there'd still be a whole you know, pile of, of stuff. So wherever she went, she went traveling throughout the world, and she, took, she made little diaries of everything, and, and then she would buy a little metal here, a little rosary there, or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, scapular over there or a medal of whoever um, and 
some of these saints, I don't even know who they are. I don't know where she got them or where she went, but, <laughs> but she, she did love to travel. And so, um, uh, anyways, the, how important it is to, to feel comfortable in your own shoes. And I don't want you or me to lose sleep at night. And we lose sleep at night when we're anxious. And that doesn't come from heaven. Anxiety and depression are not from heaven. And there's no reason why you and I have to sit with that. We, we need to acknowledge it, need to understand it, and then we need to deal with it, right? So you certainly don't ignore it because anxiety or depression or upset is saying something, especially if it's a, a lot or all the time. And by doing that, when, when you understand it, that's not the solution, but it helps to fit it into your life. Why is this happening to me? Or why do I think like this or feel like this? But the solution has to be God, has to be Christ. He's the only one that can heal us. He's the only one that can make it make sense. And maybe something happened to you a long time ago that you had nothing to do with. Maybe it was something that, um, was devastating and it wasn't your fault, but it happened. And you can remain very, very frustrated about that. You have to look at it, acknowledge it, it happened. Deal with it. What do I need to do myself to change my way of looking at that past event? How do I become master again of my life and not an incident that happened? becoming master of me. And that's not enough, though. That's psychological. That's a good psychological model. But then you have to bring it, because we're believers in the Lord, we have to bring it to him. And he's the one that wants it. Who wants that stuff? Who wants all of that? No other human being would want it. You know, who wants to take someone else's ugly yuck? But Christ does. Christ loves that. He wants to take it because that's the way he frees us. He wants to take it because that's the way he sees us change, develop, strengthen, and ready ourselves for his kingdom. See? So um, all the time we hear, you're, you're in the world, but not, okay, you're in the world, but not of the world. Better believe it. And because heaven isn't here, but it's on the way, we have to keep that in, in our mind's eye that we're headed somewhere. So then how do my, again, my decisions and my life mirror that truth? Okay. So there are seven sacraments in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox churches as well. Baptism, Holy Eucharist, Confirmation, Penance, which is the formal name for it, or uh, reconciliation, confession, holders, and matrimony. There's only been the six. Did I miss one? Yeah. Which one did I miss? Good. I did that on purpose. <laughs> the, actually, the I, I do that um, a lot of times at uh, like we're at baptism. So I'll, I'll say, so baptism, you know, it uh, happened in the uh, garden. Of uh, the Eden, which is where is that? Where is that located? Um, Anaheim, San Anaheim. And people are like, well, I don't know. you know, and then uh, and then that was uh, Adam and John, right? And 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 then some people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. So you you pick off really well <laughs> where where people are, but um, yeah. So anointing of the six, which used to be called what? Extreme unction, and so extreme unction meaning last minute. You know, before you, you pass on, let's get the priest to you. And sometimes, I don't know what's father's experience, but sometimes uh, we'll go to hospitals and you walk in and people almost gasp because they're thinking extreme unction. Well, it means they're dying, you know, when actually it's been broadened so much beautifully. So that's when uh, you're ill. It could be for um, psychological problems too, to receive the sacrament, to ease your mind. 
Um, it could be for distress, you know, real distress. There's a lot of beautiful reasons why now the sacrament can be given. Okay. It should not be given too many times for the same. It, it should be really one time for one illness, at least for a year. That's kind of what we work with. Um, and some of my priests friends um, kid about that, that, you know, some people get anointed like every three days and they're going to get oil poisoning or something because oh, it's too much. So, um, again, the sacrament does what it's supposed to do. So we have faith in that, right? And uh, the sacrament of penance or confession or reconciliation, um, it, it's important to, we have what's called devotional confessions, pious confessions. And that's where you, you go maybe every week or two weeks. Okay. But if we're not struggling with that sacrament, um, that that's a, a little red flag to me. Why so soon? I, I tell folks, I think we, we don't have a hard and fast, you know, uh, uh, about how many times uh, a year you receive. And so people, do, I go every uh, three or four weeks, if I can, to confession. I, I think it's a great sacrament. And, um, and I think you should too. I think you should go every three or four weeks. And Find a confessor, find someone that you go to, because um, what happens is you don't have to start all over as to who you are. You just say, hi, Father. Well, this was um, the past two weeks were pretty good or except otherwise I wouldn't be here, you know. Um, but it's very, very um, helpful because you're taking away something too. You're taking away sin, but you're putting something else back. What? Grace. Ooh. Right. See, you're getting it right. So you're you're taking away something, but you're not leaving a hole there in the soul. You're you're um, God's putting His grace, His life, back into you that heals. Yeah. That question about that is it still can't do it over the phone? It has to be in person. It's still it always has been, and it won't change. And here's why. None of the sacraments are done over the phone, and that's come up a, a number of times, and actually the Vatican responded to that. And they said, sacraments have to be relational. They have to be people to, with people, because that's the way Jesus did it. So any sacraments um, um, can't be done over the phone or, yeah. And especially, um, of course, that was a question that came up during the pandemic. But you notice that what we did was, um, we had uh, cards coming in and, and the priests outside confessing, putting down their window, confessing and, and going on at Blessed Sacrament. Um, gosh, we had long lines for that. And then they, at Blessed Sacrament, they have adoration every day. And that couldn't happen during the pandemic. So then they had uh, the Blessed Sacrament put into a, a monster on, on the back of a pickup truck. And then they, uh, with Bishop Tim, they went and he was seated there with the sacrament and they went through all the neighborhoods of the of the parish really slowly with the, the truck. And you cannot imagine when I was seated there in the truck with them, how beautiful it was to see all the people coming out of their homes or waiting already for the sacrament to come, you know, to their street. And then when we were coming back, it was kind of neat. We were coming back, and there's a park in front of Sigler Park in front of Blessed Sacrament Church. And we turned, and we're, we're coming back, and they started ringing bells, you know, to tell the people that were in church that, that Christ was coming back. And there was a motor, this guy in a motorcycle, and, you know, with the whole thing, you know, leather and everything. And he saw this, and then he just started riding behind the, the truck with the sacrament. And then, you know, we got to the parking lot and went up and in, and then he just kept following. He came up, you know, in the motorcycle and followed us. And then we um, took the Blessed Sacrament back into the church. And one of the priests asked him, you know, are you from here? Are you? And he said, no, he says, I'm Catholic. But it was so beautiful that I couldn't resist just following. And he said, I'm so glad. And, and, and then he went into church. Now, so the power of grace, right? See how grace touches. But it has to be, everything has to be relational. Okay. Yes.
there's a, uh, you know, it, it, when you, you do something wrong, there is a uh, kind of like an atonement. There is a right. crime and there is a punishment. Or you know, you yes. have to make up for it. Yeah. Now, um, when when we do something wrong, and um, yes, we know we're forgiven, but the atonement. Uh, and I think the reason why people don't forgive it so maybe is because you don't go to the person that you hurt and say sorry or something like that. So it was very difficult for some in some cases, in my case, I um, couldn't find myself being covered because I feel like I have to go to that person and to say right. myself. The question is about um, the sacrament of confession and atonement. You get a penance, um, and that's to help you to atone, to make up for, to restore what was lost. It can be a relationship, it can be anything, but in general, what happens is this is why there is atonement connected to the sacrament, because it's not enough to say I'm sorry, but I have to affect some change, you know, because lots of people can say I'm sorry, but the other person is so suffering on what you did. And so if it, if it this is why a penance is, um, uh, different um, for every sin that's confessed. Um, so I think, like I've said before, there's some sins that are, you know, I got mad at my mom and she, I was really annoyed with her, or I used some bad language, Father. Or I, 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 it's very easy for me to say, well, just, you know, give a little, you know, um, guidance and then say, you know, uh, please pray uh, through our Father. It's very you know, silently or take time with the Lord and, you know, things like that. But if it's something where you hurt somebody significantly, then we explore it a little bit, which is, well, how do we, how can we make this better? And is sometimes the person is dead. Sometimes the person moved away and we don't know where they are. Well, then we do the best we can and we let go. But if there is need to reconcile with someone, then you need to do that because that's even explicitly asked for it. Before going to communion, you make sure that you have reconciled with your neighbor or with the person that maybe you've hurt. So, you know, that's very, very important. When I was working with um, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, um, once a person dies, you can't reconcile with them anymore. You can only reconcile with them because it's relational, because we get it maybe from them too. We get a lot from the Jews. And um, the whole idea, again, that um, uh, you need to have a face-to-face -face healing with someone. But they do hold that once that person dies, it cannot be reconciled. That's different for Christians, very different for Catholics and for Christians, is that something happens and someone dies, and I still do atonement because I believe that the Lord sees, hears what's happening, and will affect the reconciliation that's needed. See? So we're very blessed. I mean, our theology is very beautiful and merciful and, and abundant. So let's not squeeze it and narrow it, because we, we can do that. Don't be scrupulous. Scrupulosity, St. Teresa of Avila says, it's the worst thing that can befall a person. Because when you become scrupulous, you no longer have the ability to trust in mercy. People or God, and, and you're tortured. You know? And if I give, if, uh, if I have someone who's scrupulous and I give them um, three Hail Marys, it, it tortures them. They need three rosaries you know, for three days. <laughs> then they feel okay. Yeah. But, um, and, and so you have to work with that because there's a little bit, not only the spiritual, but there's the psychological now that's being affected because a person can't trust anymore. A person can't um, see their own goodness. So remember, you have a lot of goodness in you and don't get caught up in your sins. Now deal with them, but put them in perspective. And the perspective is you are good, but you have some things to work on, and maybe some serious things, but God is also doing a lot of good. And I've noticed that with um, folks that are kind of uh, 
you know, anxious about all these things, I will ask them, let's set up a pie chart or a pie here. And, and I'll do that and then I have a slice and I say, okay, this is the problem you keep bringing to me, okay? And I'm not saying it's not a problem. I tell them, I, I agree with you, it's a problem. Okay, this slice. But what about all the rest of it? You're a good mom or you're a good dad. Uh, you love your kids. You're very conscientious at work. Um, you try to assist at church, you know, and, and giving back. Uh, and you, you go walk through all these things and say, well, look at all that. And a lot of times we don't see it anymore because we're so fixed on what's going wrong. And that's what gets us so depressed that we can't see all the good that's going on. My gosh, the Holy Spirit's doing wonderful things, trying to ease your burden, trying to move you into calmness and to a perspective of hope. And yet, if we just fix our eyes on that one piece, it can be really burdensome. And you can't do that. Yeah. Like the mortal area, the, the mortal area. So, you know, can you do what your Christian friends does? It's like in between the reconciliation during the day to say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry that I, you know, wasn't patient with my, you know, with this person, or I'm sorry that I, you know, might have wanted like that person. You know, just, you know, say, I'm sorry, you know, at that point, and know that, you know, God has had mercy on you and have forgiven you. You know, I, I don't have the resources to be in the confession every day. No, you don't want you in confession every day. <laughs> so there's no argument here. I mean, I agree with you. There's no argument here. I just want to underline that, first of all, like um, uh, Scripture says, the just man sins every day. The just man. So that's from the um, Hebrew Scriptures, Old Testament. So the reality is we're sinners, you know, and... Let's get over it. Okay, acknowledge it. You're a sinner. Okay, now let's move our lives towards the kingdom. You know, dealing with things, but let's not label it in such a way that it creates a uh, a distance between me and others and God. Because isolation is one of the great great gifts of the devil. Isolation, because of your shame, your guilt, all sorts of things you isolate from people, family, and then from church. Because um, if they really knew me, they wouldn't want me in here. Okay, and that's all. That's not from heaven. Never. It was Pope Francis, right, who said the church is like a hospital, you know, and everybody's sick. And so he said everybody's sick. There's nobody in the church that isn't sick, but we all need a different healing from the doctor, from Christ. And and we're there because we need it. We're in the hospital because we we get it. We need um, to be healed. Okay, and and that's why we're in church because no one here is perfect. You're not perfect till you go to heaven. And so, um, um, so many times, oh, I feel like a hypocrite. Well, you are a hypocrite. Okay, you too. All right. Okay. Now, what, let's go on to the next question. But, but Father, I'm angry. Yeah, I know. I got it. I get it. Yeah, me too. Okay. So we all strive to follow Jesus. We say who we are. We're Christians. We say we believe in the Lord and we're, we, we want to be another Christ in the world. And then we fail miserably. But at least we know it. And at least we acknowledge it. You know? And um, there was a, a lady that uh, came to me and she says, I have a neighbor and she goes to mass and she always has her rosary and so forth. And she is the most annoying woman. And I go out into my yard and if she's there, I try to run back into my house because she is just so cranky. And she said, then she's going to mass father every day and Sunday and with her rosary. And I said, well, just imagine if she wasn't going to mass. But I really believe that she'd be a lot worse off, you know, 
because when you're when you're in relationship, you're trying to be in relationship. Trying, something's happening. Some good's happening. And um, I mean, we've all had these these situations where we've seen conversion to it, right? And it just takes your breath away. I a, when I worked at St. Joseph Hospital uh, during the summers, I'd come home from seminary and I'd work at St. Joseph. And there was a woman um, who was on our, our team and staff, and she was did something terrible. You know, really um, cranky, aloof, even mean. Uh, didn't want to be really uh, connected with any of us. She was not Catholic. She belonged to a um, very small a very intense um, church. And um, then one summer I came back and she was so burdened. I mean, you could tell she was just all the time. One summer I came back and all of a sudden I looked at her and I said, something different about this woman. And I realized, oh my gosh, she has makeup on. And she never would wear makeup because she this small church just forbade that dancing anything joy happiness forbid it all you know and then i i went up to her and i said hey, you're different and she said i became a catholic <laughs> i said what she became a catholic she said i just feel so free and happy and I went to confession and she was telling me all of it you know, going on and I couldn't stop her. I was like, hey, I got to go work, you know, <laughs> but she became just the joy of the whole team. You know, and that's what Catholics should be, not frowning. Not angry. Not cranky. These things happen, but they shouldn't be with you all the time. You shouldn't be like that neighbor next door, you know. There should be joy. Joy is the measurement of holiness. Okay, next slide. What's needed for a valid sacrament? This is just for those people that are theological nerds, I guess. So you need valid matter. That means water for baptism. You can't use juice. You know, you can't use oil, you know, from the car. You can, it has to be water. And we'll look into Didache talks a little bit about that in a few moments. You can't mess with the formula. So if the church is given a certain formula, which is I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you can't change that to I baptize you in the name of God who is all loving and gracious. That's true, but it's not the formula. And so in the church's estimation, a baptism has not happened unless you use the formula. It's the same with consecration at Mass. We cannot change the words of consecration. Otherwise, what was going to be Mass and you receiving Holy Communion becomes an agape. It becomes a really nice prayer service, and you're receiving bread, remembering the Last Supper, but it's not the Holy Eucharist. Okay. So uh, the formulas that the Church gives are connected to Holy Scripture, but what's given by the words of Christ, those are the formulas that we, we use. Don't mess with it. Yeah. I think it's a, a baptism can be done by a lay person. A baptism can be done actually by anybody, even a non-Christian. Yes. And that happens in a situation like, let's say, in a hospital. And it used to be on auction. Actually, I'm not sure if this is taught anymore, but certainly in um, my cousin's time, who were a little bit older than me, they're all nurses, and they were all taught, everyone was taught, that if a baby is dying and it's a Catholic family, that you, um, you learn the formula and you do that because the parents can't come in or whatever, and, and so the, the little bit of water I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very simple. That's all that's needed for a valid baptism. Okay. You can't use the non Catholic. Well, if they want it, I mean, if they don't want it, I, I don't baptize them. Oh, an infant? No, 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 because you have to, no, no, you have to respect a, a parent's right to bring up their children, right? And so, you baptize when you know that faith is going to continue.
Father, what do you think? <laughs> That's a good theological question, actually. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I, I, I'm not quite sure myself. That's a good question because, um, well, if a baby is dying in the hospital and um, it's not a, a, a Catholic, should you just, you know, baptize the baby anyway? Because of the whole teaching, unless you be baptized, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But um, I think the church would say you have to reverence um, uh, where people, what they choose in their life. You cannot force it. Maybe. Huh? Maybe. Yeah, I'm just saying that the church, I think, reverences the, the decisions of parents. Yeah. What about how the person would die? I think he's not even. Yeah. No. No one can. Yeah. The question is. Yeah. The question is. Um, when someone is dying and they cannot receive um, the uh, anointing of the sick, can anybody do that? No. But you got to remember too. That's not necessary for salvation. That's a a very great assistance. But if it's not there. That doesn't mean a person is not going to go, has no chance of going to heaven. Or if they're not able to receive their last Holy Communion or something like that. It's a wonderful um, viaticum. It's a wonderful gift. But that doesn't mean that, oh my gosh, the gates are closed now. You know, Because even remember, even a person who's not able to go to confession and has a serious sin, and as they're dying and there's no priest, no one, Maybe it's an accident or something like that, and they they throw themselves on the love and mercy of Jesus. That will be enough. Okay. Yes. Besides, uh, if the baby does not have the parents with them, how? Well, Benedict gave us some real good guidance where he said, you must have some kind of assurance that the child will be brought up uh, with the sacraments and in Catholic faith. Otherwise, don't. So there has to be somebody, grandmother, uh, best friend who's been there forever and will be there forever, hopefully. Mm -hmm. there, but you cannot just baptize. In a war situation, no. You have to, now you remember too that the church has given us these beautiful things, the sacraments, but um, it doesn't mean that everybody outside of sacraments is going to hell. You know, their God is his mercy and goodness is more abundant, but sacraments are there to help us with certainty and sureness towards the kingdom. And to to make us saints now instead of later, um, there's a lot of reasons for sacraments. But but those who are not part of this, the sacramental life doesn't mean that they're all going to hell that they're losing their salvation. That would mean you're cutting away all the really most people of the world, and um, that's not our teaching. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Valid intention. Do what the church intends. So. Um, I had one time uh, somebody say, hey, Father, can you come to, like, if you come to my pool and you bless it, is it all holy water now? <laughs> and so I said, no, it's not the way it works. Or, you know, you have to have the intention of the church. Church doesn't intend that pools are big baptismal bonds. <laughs> so, um, or donuts being used. Gosh, we couldn't, I forgot the host. We'll have to go get the donuts then. And I'll just do it this way. No, I did that's not the intention of the church. Okay, you forgot the host. Father, dumb. Okay, now we got to do something else. Let's have a, a prayer service. But you can't um, put bagels in or, or that kind of thing. Okay. Valid mind, understanding, and freedom. And I think that's what we're we're talking about here in a lot of different ways. There has to be understanding. Someone receiving baptism has to understand what it what it means. And then freedom, that they have to be free to be able to do that. 
Um, that's the only way that we can convert valid baptism. Now, a little interesting aside, during the war, Pius XII uh, gave permission for Jews to be um, given baptismal um, certificates that they were baptized in the Catholic Church and so forth. And uh, But after the war, they were not held to that. But he did that in order to try and get them out of the, you know, the, the view of uh, the Gestapo. So um, anyways, okay, next slide, please. Sacramentals, really quickly, what's the difference? Well, sacramentals, the miraculous medal, the rosary, these are not instituted by Christ, but by the church. Sacraments are instituted by Christ. Um, they do not confer grace, but they dispose us to receive grace. Okay. But the sacrament, boy, that's that's a win-win. It's always a perfect communication with God as far as from God's uh, vantage point. Is that cute? We had a priest who sometimes I'll get asked to baptize a baby, you know, immersion. And I always try to dissuade parents from that because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you immerse and the baby comes up. <gasps> You know, and I think, gosh, I hope I'm not doing any kind of damage to their little psyches or something. But, um, you know, you, we, we had a priest who, who passed the baby through the water. And when he brought the baby up, the baby sprayed all over everybody. Um, so, and, he, and I remember he, he said to me, he said, never again. <laughs> okay. Well, let's leave it there for a moment. Thanks. Okay, so baptism, according to, if we look at our Didache, it uh, reminds us that it's done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's very important. Dr. Schuler, for a number, well, not, not a lot of years, but there was a short amount of time where he was baptizing with rose petals, no water. And he used the formula but he was baptizing with rose petals, which is very pretty. But again, it's not baptism. And so the um, uh, Catholic Church, I remember, put out from, I think, the USCCB, saying that if anyone from Dr. Shulu's church who was baptized then had become Catholic, um, we have to look at that, make sure that they were baptized uh, when they came into the Catholic Church. Right? So one of the hard things that happened with me when I was working for USCCB was um, we have uh, different churches, Protestant churches, and they all agree that we use the formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with pouring water three times. That's agreed upon by all the Christian churches, major Christian churches. That's not always what happens though. And so there, could be a number of people who actually were not validly baptized who enter RCIA and we just um, suspect or, or think, well, okay, you're baptized by the church. Well, they hold to that formula. Okay, you know, just give you now, you know, Holy Communion and Confirmation and so forth. But um, it really becomes important, and we were, were talking with the bishops about this, that in RCIA or OCIA, it's very important that you just do a little bit more work with that. Ask about that a little bit more. In my young days when I was affiliated, I was raised Catholic, but I got into the uh, Pentecostal movement. And the thing was baptizing in the name of Jesus. Right. And there was very, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit didn't fit there. Right. It had, you know, I, and I've always wondered, well, there are actually are two formulas that come out in Scripture in the name of Jesus and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, determined early on, centuries and centuries back, that it would be the formula in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And primarily because of the scriptural text at the end of Matthew, which we'll look at. But let's take a break. We're at a little bit. I think after eight. So let's take, if you don't mind, a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Okay.
Hello, everybody. Okay, let's jump into baptism. So I want you to turn. Some of you may have spotted this, and maybe some of you haven't. Uh, please open your Bibles. And we're going to go first to the New Testament, and in the New Testament, the Gospel of St. Matthew. Okay. So hopefully we're at St. Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Remember? And then um, we're looking at chapter 28. Chapter 28. And then we're looking at in chapter 28, verse 16. And maybe it says, like it does in mind, the commissioning of the disciples uh, is in dark print. And you may want to note or maybe even place a little star in your scripture Bible. Uh, some people are comfortable writing in the Bible, some aren't. But this is really um, the commissioning, what's called the Great Commissioning. And I'll read it. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. This is after resurrection. When they saw him, they worshiped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of the, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age, or we used to say the end of the world. But the end of the age is, is supposed to, it's a poetic of way of being even more expansive than the end of the world, actually. So um, this here's the formula. Baptizing them out in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, from early on, from all the documents, even outside of Didache that we have, we see that that becomes the accepted formula of the church until even today. Um, the commissioning, remember, it's not enough to baptize, but there has to be the faith component involved in that, which we've been touching on in our questions. So to just baptize is not sufficient. You have to baptize with um, faith and we'll call it an evangelizing spirit. So all of you here in this room should be, need to be, need to grow and develop more in, all of us, me included, in a missionary spirit, an evangelical spirit. Okay. And what that means is that everything I do has to be from the lens of Christ. Everything I say, everything, it really has to take over. So we talk about um, in exorcism being possessed by the devil, um, but you, you should be possessed by the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit then who will push you forward to get witness. And it's a, it's a question that's important. Um, how is your missioning doing? How's your witnessing doing? Again, has your faith and or religion become somewhat privatized? You say your prayers, you go to mass and so forth, but is there ever an invitation that stretches you uncomfortably outside of yourself? Because it is always a little uncomfortable. I have to be truthful about that. But how many times, and sometimes you won't get a good response, but how many times people appreciate that you even noticed that something was wrong or that, you know, you, you offered to help. Even my mom, she used to, she, you know, she carried all these rosaries. And if somebody, she'd say, you know, why don't you pray to the Blessed Mother? She'll help you and give a rosary. And it might not even be a Catholic as much. It doesn't matter. 
It's the Blessed Mother, it doesn't matter. And, but I, I was amazed at all the time when I was there and that happened, people were very gracious, you know, and they received it graciously. And I think because um, they, they recognized that she cared. I had a rabbi friend who um, was in the hospital, a very serious condition, and I went to see him and I brought him a rosary from Israel. But it didn't have the Christ on the cross. It's just a simple cross. And he, he got it and he got teary and he, and he said, Father, thank you. I will receive this. And he said, thank you for being sensitive to just the cross. He says, I can, I can deal with that. Because, you know, the Jews have a hard time with Christ on the cross. It's all that. But, um, but he said, it, what you do, what you're doing, which means so much to me, is you, you're telling me that you care, and I appreciate that. You're giving me something that's special to you, to me. And he still has that that rosary, and he tells the rabbis that all the time. And it, you know, so there's, um, we need to be sensitive, but we need to also stretch as best we can, and you know your audience as best we can too, because if um, Maybe it's too much to say, hey, let's pray a Hail Mary together. Well, if, if they're not conversant with the Virgin, if they don't know the Virgin, or it's a, a faith tradition that doesn't honor her the way we do, but maybe that's too much of a stretch at first. Let's talk about the Lady of, well, maybe not yet. Let's talk about Jesus. Um, let's talk about, you want to talk about Mary? Let's talk about Mary, but let's talk about her from Luke. The Gospel of Luke, because every Protestant knows the Gospel of Luke, you know, the, and know the, the story of the angel coming to Mary. It's a beautiful moment. That's a meeting place. See, it's a meeting place. But I would never talk about our Lady of Guadalupe, you know, at that moment. I love her. And she's there. I mean, if the conversations keep moving, we'll get there. But, but to start where my friend can meet me, and where we can begin a, a good conversation. That's good missioning. See? Okay. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, I, I think I told you I used to go door to door when I was a pastor at uh, St. Cecilia's in the summertime. And I would knock on a door, and sometimes uh, people would open the door and scream, you know, scream, we're Jehovah's Witness, you know. A couple of times they'd happen and then slam the door, you know, because the Jehovah Witness, you know, the priest is Satan. He's the devil. Don't come into my house. Yeah. So, you know, and I can either get deflated and walk and walk away. No, I just recognize that's that's what they believe. It's okay. But I will tell you, I went to a lot of Protestant homes where people were so warm and brought me in and we sat down and we talked. And then I said, can we pray together? Absolutely, Father. And then grab my hand and then they begin the most beautiful prayers, you know, and, and we leave, you know, just feeling all of us really good. Me too. And um, sometimes I went to a Catholic home and it's not very responsive. Oh, yeah, we're Catholic. Oh, you know, I'm the priest. And there's a church there. It's just, it's just two streets from you. <laughs> you know, it's a big steeple, big bell, you know. But um, but it's important to stretch and to to evangelize and to re-evangelize. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of Catholics that need to be re-evangelized. They're in hibernation. Okay, they're in hibernation, and to kind of wake them up that there's something beautiful going on at Saint Anne's. You know, to invite them to the Women's Guild. You know, because it's vibrant and there's so much they're doing, or the Knights of Columbus who are very, very active here. Um, but any, you know, uh, mass. So what? They're not Catholic. You know, I I've gone to Protestant services, haven't you? It's okay. And um, there's some uh, gospel music from um, the South. There's some uh, choirs. Oh my gosh! I, and I, there's a couple of choirs that I. Uh, African-American that I put on, they're huge and they're amazing. And the music is beautiful and gospel music is from God. There's just no doubt. 
That is tr a true American treasure gospel. It came out of a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, but it touches the hearts of people, of everybody who's a believer, you know. Okay. So here we are, we got it here in the word of God. You shall baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And guess what? It's not just for the apostles, it's for the disciples. That means it's from or for you and me, all of us together. We need to do this together. And how beautiful it is when someone begins to get closer to God just for simply because I said, I'll pray with you. Or maybe they're not connected to any church and they decide, you know what? I like St. Anne's. You know, there's plenty of people. This is um, one of the most um, unchurched uh, counties. Orange County. Unchurched. That means they, they have no affiliation with any particular church. They're just there. They may have many years ago, but right now they do not affiliate with anything. And that means they're waiting. That means there's possibilities and opportunities. And not to fill St. Anne's. That's not the way we do way we do this or why we do this, but to bring people closer to Christ, to let them see who we are, and they make a free decision to belong to St. Anne's, right? Because they love Jesus, because we love Jesus, and they're seeing something that they need and they want. Okay? Because if we're doing this right, people will want it. They will want to know why you're Catholic. Don't keep it quiet and private. Yeah, okay. So if you look at uh, chapter seven, but concerning baptism, thus shall you baptize, having first recited all these things, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in living water or running water. So that's the goal. That's the most beautiful way to do it, the preferred way. But if you do not have living water, then baptize in other water. So if it's not a river or an ocean, well, then, you know, use your tap water, I guess, or, you know. And if you're not able in cold, then in warm. Now, I'm not sure what Father does, but when I baptize babies, it's not cold water I use, but it's warmed up water because they enjoy it a lot more. Okay, you use cold water, you're gonna get a good screen. But if you have neither, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the preferred way in the beginning was to do it as a community in large uh, areas of water at the beach or the river, River Jordan, right? But then what happens is the, the religion begins to spread quickly. You're in a lot of places that are not close to running water. And so because of that, then you begin to get formulas that are reminding you that, well, if you can at least pour water three times over the head, that is sufficient. That becomes normative, really, in the Catholic Church. In most Orthodox churches, they still immerse. In many Protestant churches, they still immerse. In Catholic churches, too, we do have immersion. That is um, a, uh, uh, an option. But normally, what happens is the pouring of water three times. And it shouldn't be like taking a spoon and there we go, and there we go. And, no, it should be generous, you know, because Symbols need to be generous. Uh, otherwise, um, why have the symbol? You know, if it's if it's if it's there to be used um, and to be enjoyed. Incense. I'm sorry. I love incense, but I don't put just a little bit. Anybody knows me? I put a lot of incense. I know we have a little church. I don't know how that's going to work, but but um, at least I'm not Orthodox. If I was Orthodox, we'd have incense every day. So, and every mass. Um, so, but incense again, see, what does it do? It's beautiful. It rises up and you can see it in the sunlight going up. And it's a beautiful sign of prayer ascending to God the Father. It also cleanses. 
So in the work that I did with exorcism, um, incense actually is very, very important. We've always known that. Um, what is it they use? Um, sage. You ever seen that? Sometimes on TV they have whatever. Um, they're trying to get rid of something and they light sage and they go through and they're like, oh, it's gone. It's gone. I, I, which I have my doubts about because I don't know if incense or sage can do that just like that. But but it does have a cleansing power, uh, the sweetness of incense. As well, holy water. Teresa of Avila says, um, not only to remind you of your baptism when you come into church, that's what that's for, the font, but also she says it has cleansing properties. And she says, when you're dealing with darkness, actually holy water is one of the most powerful, simply powerful things that can be used against darkness. Okay. So we have the custom of having our homes blessed when you get a new home with you know holy water and um, or maybe once a year, some people do that uh, around Epiphany and so forth. If you're from Eastern churches, that's a very common thing. And again, the, the whole purpose really is to cleanse, to clean. Because um, like in church, even in church, because some will, sometimes some will say, well, how, the devil could never enter church. Oh, sure he could. Why not? Oh, you could never. The tabernacles are, well, the devil went right up to Jesus many times in Scripture. So that, that's not the, the question, but sometimes people bring in negativity, if nothing else, negative something, and they leave it when they leave. That happens in homes, by the way. Some homes have a real heaviness about them, and it's because there's been a lot of anger or worse in that home. It needs to be cleaned, and a simple way to do it is to have a house Cleaned, holy water. Um, in one uh, uh, blessing of a home that I went to, uh, the woman called me because she said um, she's older and she had her grandkids that were visiting uh, during the summertime. And she said, um, there's this one room where they love to play, but it's there's something wrong with the room. And she said, I don't know what it is, but I'm afraid for my grandchildren because they're scared. They walk into, they're little kids, but they get scared in there and they run out. They will not go in that room. And she said, it seems dark, even though the sun is out. And it's just, you're not comfortable in there. So I went to the house and did the prayers and blessed that room with um, holy water. And, um, and we prayed together and it was finished. And um, I, I talked to her later and she said, Father, it's, there's... The kids went in there and had a great time. And it's just different now. You know, whatever it was there, it's gone. I don't know what it was. I don't either. Just know it's gone. Well, when I left Blessed Sacrament, this is years later, she wrote me a little note. She said, the room is still beautiful. Thank you. She said, after, she said, so many years, I couldn't get anybody to stay in there because it was so uncomfortable. And the kids, especially little ones who don't know anything about what's going on with that kind of stuff, but they had an instinctual aversion to that room. And now that's all gone. So the church has given us these things that really help, you know, in a lot of uh, situations that are kind of difficult to figure out. They're supernatural. Okay. Now, here's interesting, something very interesting. But before the baptism, let him that baptizes and that is baptized fast. I've forgotten about this. And any others also who are able. And you shall order him that is baptized to fast a day or two before baptism. Well, I don't know if, if I mean, I, I don't think we're, we would be going to asking people to fast for two days before baptism. I don't want them to pass out during the Easter vigil or something like that. But there is something about maybe, uh, what is the preparation you do before baptism? Maybe it is a little bit of fasting. Maybe it's extra prayer. Maybe it's some works of charity, you know, special works of charity. But maybe to, you know, as a, a way of preparing for such a momentous thing, um, at least maybe it can point us, this that was done in the ancient church, can point us to something that we can adapt in church today, right? Okay. 
I'm going to end here because we're already at 830. We will pick up uh, with baptism and go into the Holy Communion next time. Um, but if you haven't read through, then please do that. Um, let's see. Just want to tell you where to stop. OK, up to chapter 10. OK, and uh, we will see you next time. So here's a little bit of evangelization. Why don't you invite somebody to come next week? See what you do with it and see if there's somebody that you think might enjoy being here um, as we continue on this uh, journey. Uh, what is it called? What's that called? All right, good, good, good. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, <laughs> Lord, we praise you and thank you. We ask your blessing fall upon us. Help us to appreciate the great things that have been given to us by Jesus himself and has been passed on faithfully to us through the apostles and in the church. And we pray, Lord, that it will affect us in such a way that we will become harbingers of good, missionaries of light, inviting people to the better things, and finally even to you and to the kingdom. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.